Hello, everyone. Welcome to the May Recreational Astronomy Night meeting, online version of the Toronto Centre RASC. My name is Paul Markov, and I will be your virtual host for this evening. So uh, let's get the meeting started um, with Dennis Gray in the sky this month. But uh, give us a few seconds to get set up, and uh, Dennis will be right up. Ah, Dennis is ready to go, I'm hearing. Okay. So over to you, Dennis. Great, thank you. Very, great, thank you very much, Paul. And uh, <clears throat> thanks again also to the technical team. Really impressed with how well this is coming together and knowing uh, a little bit about how much uh, work is behind the scenes here to get all this uh, working for everybody and looking and, um, and flowing like a smooth presentation. So the sky this month, I'm just going <clears> to <throat> cover a few things here. And you are my cursor, so it's in the right place. And tell my computer to go for it. There we go. So um, as usual, I, I have um, each one of the people that does the sky this month, I notice has their own particular style and their own particular way of doing things. And uh, I like to start with what I call the big picture, uh, cover off some, uh, and then cover off specific topics that are related to it. And, and if the purpose of the sky this month, if you will, is to give everybody sort of <clears throat> things that they can look forward to, things that they can do, maybe some ideas for you to see and to cha uh, challenge you a little bit in terms of uh, getting out there and doing some observing. As Paul has said, we've had some excellent skies over the past couple of months and uh, I've been able, to, I know I've been able to do more observing than I have been in, in quite a while and it's, uh, it's encouraging and hopefully it'll continue going for the, the rest of this year. So I'm gonna be uh, talking about some of the highlights this month. Um, as it turns out, there's not that much going on up there this month, so there's actually less than some of that. And so I'm gonna spend a few minutes and I'm gonna uh, diverge into a little bit of a, a talk about uh, cometary information and how to get it uh, for planning your uh, your observing uh, runs and so forth. So let's get started. So the first news is if you haven't heard it already, uh, there was uh, a big uh, moment that was supposed to happen this afternoon. Uh, the Dragon capsule was the first, uh, was supposed to be launched with real people going to the space station. So uh, the SpaceX uh, Falcon 9 rocket has had a lot of successful cargo type flights, satellite launches and so on. This was going to put uh, some astronauts into into orbit and uh, have them hook up with the space station. Unfortunately, it was scrubbed due to weather, but it has been rescheduled to Saturday at 3.22 in the afternoon. Um, one of the interesting uh, tidbits that I picked up uh, when I was looking at that was this is only the fifth time in the U.S. history that they've actually had a brand new rocket on the launch pad. So it's Mercury, Gemini, Apollo, and the space shuttle uh, were the four prior to this one. So this is really kind of a milestone event. Uh, hopefully everything's going to go really well on, on Saturday and we're looking forward to that. So, uh, the big picture, as usual, I uh, like to start off with this picture, which comes from... Uh, moonwise.co in the UK. But what the big picture here shows is um, essentially the whole uh, things that are going on on the ecliptic as we're going along. So starting on this side on the left, the sun is setting and in, this, in the evening sky, we have Gemini uh, hangover uh, winter constellation still visible there. And then we get into the spring constellations. Uh, the moon in the middle of the month will be uh, just outside of uh, in, in Scorpius and then our summer constellations and so forth are coming up and then by the time we come to the next morning uh, the sun comes back again and the sun is still roughly in the same location in the in the, in the uh, ecliptic uh, but it's uh, obviously we've had a night that goes on in the middle there so we're in the northern hemisphere and a lot of these constellations should be familiar to uh, to many of us here. Um, the other thing I always like to talk about a little bit is just where we are in terms of the, um, uh, the, the annual uh, journey around the sun. So right now we're here just before June, and as you can see, we're coming up to the solstice, which is the, uh, the summer solstice when the sun stands still. It's the longest um, uh, or the shortest night of the year, uh, and it uh, is essentially uh, starting to to slow down as we as we reach this sort of inflection point here in the summer so you can see the total number of hours of night that we have tonight four hours and 28 minutes by june 21st that'll be down to uh, three hours and 48 minutes so we're going to lose about a half an hour of night between now and then and where we're going to lose it we're going to lose a little bit of it in each one of these departments so we're going to lose a little bit of time um, 
to more daylight. So we're going to have more time when the sun is up, an extra 20 minutes. We're going to have more time for civil twilight, five minutes, more time for nautical twilight here, another five minutes of nautical twilight, and another 10 minutes or so of astronomical twilight. And when you add all of those up, it makes our night, pure night time, the time that astrophotographers like the best, uh, is, is gets as short as it possibly can. So this suggests that uh, a lot of the astronomy that we may be doing uh, will be done not necessarily in full dark because uh, there's not that much nighttime left to work with, if you will, once we get past that. One of the other things that I like to sort of position ourselves with is in terms of where we are. If we look at the galaxy and think about where we are, we're out somewhere out in uh, one of the outer arms of the Milky Way. And in the summertime, when we look uh, towards the Milky Way, we're looking towards the central bulge of the galaxy. In the winter, when we're looking at the winter Milky Way as it goes through constellations like Orion and so forth, that's uh, you know, looking out still a Milky Way there, but a lot less intense than the summer Milky Way. But now in the springtime, we're looking outside of the plane of the Milky Way at when, uh, when it gets dark. So we're not seeing the Milky Way very much at all. It's coming soon as we um, bend our way around in, in the Earth's orbit to get closer and closer to the summer. But right now we're looking outside. So there's less to see in terms of uh, star clusters and so forth. There's still a few interesting ones to look at. But this is why it's galaxy season, because we're able to see outside of the our own galaxy and look towards galaxies that are pointed in other areas. So when we look at the spring sky, um, you can see the ecliptic rolling along here. Uh, we've got two of the major galaxy centric uh, constellations, Leo the lion with that backwards question mark hook there and the uh, posterior uh, marked off by uh, three uh, stars there. And the less, um, less uh, notable constellation Virgo, which has got the star Spica in it. Spica is the star that really stands out, but the constellation is quite a large constellation. And in both of these constellations, we have a lot of galaxies. So this is uh, the time of year when the galaxies are most prominent. And also there's some good galaxies in Coma Bernice, Bernices up here as well. Uh, as we move forward in the year, of course, these are gonna move along and we're gonna get into the summer constellations. And already we're starting to see uh, those summer constellations become more prominent in the evening sky. So in terms of what's going on with the planets this month, so uh, the first and uh, highlight is Mercury. So Mercury is actually in, uh, in one of its more favorable uh, apparitions for the year. And, uh, but Mercury, of course, in its 87 or so day orbit is very quick. So uh, there's some good viewing for, for it in the evening sky between now and about, about mid-June. You need a good horizon for it, of course, and it's, uh, it's fairly bright. Um, Venus is also um, uh, ma making moves right now because of, not necessarily because of its orbital speed, but because of where it is in its orbit. It's close to inferior conjunction. So it's passing us on the inside lane between um, Earth and the Sun. And as it does that, it comes vroom around the corner. And uh, it's going to be shifting from the evening sky and showing up in the morning sky and start to rise rapidly as we go into June. Jupiter and Saturn are very close together right now. Uh, Jupiter is lapping, uh, going to be lapping Saturn over the next couple of years. Uh, they're rising near midnight uh, together, almost within 20 minutes of each other, very well placed in the morning sky. And um, this is actually a good opportunity if you're interested in getting planetary images of uh, Jupiter and Saturn, is to set your alarm clock, get up early, and catch them in the morning sky when the air is generally more steady, so you'll get good seeing, and you'll have an opportunity to image them when they're near their uh, best available uh, height for this season. And the biggest one to talk about is Mars. So uh, this month is when Mars watch, quote unquote, kind of begins. Um, there is a, a general rule of thumb, which is that uh, we need about 10 degrees of um, uh, diameter in, in an astronomical object like Mars for you to start to see good detail. Uh, you can look at it at any time, but when it's uh, four you know, degrees or something like that, very small, you just see basically an orange dot and it's not really that useful. But now we're at the point where we're starting to see 
uh, Mars is right around this here between May and June 12th, uh, it's starting to show up. And the south polar cap is particularly noticeable. We're coming into um, the northern spring here. And over, you can see between now and October, that south polar cap is going to change from a very <clears throat> noticeable white spot to an almost invisible white spot as it shrinks and all of the carbon dioxide uh, sublimates into the atmosphere. Um, the best observing is going to be in the morning time, uh, as I noted be, uh, before, but uh, this is really quite exciting and I think we'll be talking a lot about uh, Mars over the next few um, months as we go, get closer and closer. Although it's not quite as large as it was the last time it came by in August of 2018, it's much higher. It's like 20 degrees higher in the sky in August, which means that it's way further out of the uh, disturbance in the atmosphere. So it's going to be a lot clearer. The scene will be better. So what you lose in a little bit of size of Mars, you're going to make up for with much better conditions and be able to see more detail on the planet and get better pictures if you choose to do that. So just in terms of some of the details of the timings here, um, so Mercury today, these times are all of, as of today, and this will change over the month, uh, but uh, Mercury is setting quite late. It's following the sun down, but it's going to be quite close to the horizon. Uh, Venus is still up there, dropping fast. It's going to be reaching inferior conjunction on June 3rd um, when it passes in front of the sun. And I think it's interesting for those of us who remember the Venus transit in 2012 and 2004, the transit of Venus was June 5th. And if um, Venus was reaching inferior conjunction on June 5th, we would have another transit of Venus. So it's missing by two days. So, uh, and I think Ron may be talking about this in his talk, the repetitive cycles of Venus. So it's doing its eight year uh, repetitive cycle and it's just missing a transit and it's gonna keep doing that for the next 120 years or so, unfortunately. Uh, Mars is rising at uh, 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 2.17 in the uh, morning. So it's going to only be best uh, when you get up early. And as I mentioned, Jupiter and Saturn, both around midnight. Um, Neptune is up as well, uh, but Uranus is really, really deep in the dawn twilight right now. So you're not going to have a good opportunity to see that. But now with planets, there's always a little bit of dancing going on. There's a few not notable appulses. Um, so we've got uh, June 8th and 9th, Monday and Tuesday night. Uh, you'll find the waxing moon will be just below Jupiter and Saturn. So Jupiter and Saturn are close together, and the moon's going to cruise by them in uh, June 8th and 9th, which will make for you know uh, a nice striking group in the in the southern south, and it'll be uh, available uh, shortly after uh, sunset. Um, on June 12th, it's a Friday, Mars will be um, passing just uh, above Neptune, as we see it from here. Um, so that's a telescopic... Um, view, you can have a look at, at, uh, at Mars, and then if you just move your telescope up a little bit, you'll see Neptune as well. And then Friday uh, at dawn, uh, we're expecting a, a really nice conjunction of Venus and the Moon. They're going to be quite close as seen from Toronto. There's actually, um, uh, the Moon is actually going to uh, occult Venus from north of a line roughly of sort of James Bay to Newfoundland kind of area, like north and east of here, uh, but it'll be very close for us. So it'll be uh, very noticeable. The, uh, the moon will be a very, very slender crescent and Venus will be as well. Um, so that's something to keep your eye on if you're able to get up early in the morning on that Friday. Just in terms of a few things about the moon this month. So um, the full moon is coming up June 5th. It's uh, the so-called strawberry moon, which reminds us that strawberry shortcake season will be in soon. Um, we have an interesting connection here, which is that the, the new moon um, uh, and the, the summer solstice are coming together. Uh, they're, they're within six hours of each other this year, which creates the rare summer sunstop moon, uh, which I plan to uh, go out and try to uh, promote that and see if I can get everybody to talk about the summer sun stop moon. Uh, there's also at the same time an annual, annular, not annual, if only, an annular <laughs> eclipse in Asia. So uh, that's uh, a nice eclipse that's going to go over India, China, and a few other places near the equator. Uh, the moon is too far away to cover the entire sun, so it won't be 
as impressive, but there should be some interesting photographs to see uh, about that. So as you can see, we have short nights and um, there's not uh, a lot of good planetary opportunities. Most of the planetary opportunities are in the morning. Um, but there are a couple of opportunities. I wanted to try and come up with some things that people might enjoy doing. So we have uh, this month um, some good opportunities to sort of see uh, over the, the lunar pole. So as the graphic here illustrates, the moon is sort of does a little rocking motion in its orbit while it keeps the same face to us all the time. You can sometimes see glimpse a little bit over the edge of the moon and see a little bit more of the lunar surface than you would uh, expect. So we can see up to 59% of the moon's surface instead of just 50%. And this month we have two opportunities on June 14th, that the third quarter and June 1st uh, coming up when you can see uh, either the southern limb of the moon or the northern limb. So the things that uh, you might be able to spot there with a bit of uh, research and so forth, uh, the Leibniz Mountains are um, poking up over the southern edge, over the, near the south pole of the moon. And those are the edge, uh, the visible edge of the south polar Aitken Basin, which is the largest um, impact crater structure that we know about for sure. Uh, and most of it is hidden on the far side of the moon. Um, the, the June 4th opportunity, there you may be able to spot the mountains, the peaks that are always up in uh, in sunlight. So there are a few mountains near the northern pole of the moon that are called the peaks of eternal light. And they've been identified as a good opportunity potentially for um, uh, human colonization because all you would need to do is put some solar panels up on those mountains and you would have 24 hour uh, power available to you for any kind of a future uh, lunar base. So that's something that you might be interested in taking in. Now I mentioned I was going to uh, uh, take you, uh, take a little bit of a, a detour and talk a little bit about comets. So one thing I came across in my research is this uh, a site called cobs.si. Um, let's see if we can get it to come up here again. Yeah, so this is the Comet Observation Database, COBS. So um, I came across this when I was looking for a good site to help identify um, good observing opportunities for comets. And uh, one of the things I noticed is that there's a lot of amateurs participating on this site uh, one thing they're doing is they're doing light curve analyses of uh, comets. So this one here, for example, is a light curve of comet Swan, which is one of the comets that uh, is currently there. So, you know, so essentially it uh, peaked in, uh, you know, late April, early May around magnitude five, and it's falling off. Now people are saying it's, it's around nine or something like that. So that's potentially uh, means it's well past its best before date as far as comets go. Which, uh, which is uh, one of those things there. So that was interesting. But what was really interesting was that they offer a custom observing planner uh, feature here where you can put in your own uh, latitude and longitude and coordinates and what kinds of comets that you, uh, what's your limiting magnitude, how good is your equipment in other words. And it'll come back with a curated list of comets that you can see. So when I put in our coordinates here in Toronto, and I said a limiting magnitude of about 10 because I live downtown and <clears throat> you need uh, something pretty bright to punch through that mess. Um, so I found that I would recommend three comets. Now, these two comets here are, are basically circumpolar um, and they're not particularly observable because they're too close to the sun. However, um, this comet Panstars here, um, you know, is magnitude, currently magnitude nine. And it's saying, you know, when is it, when is it, when it becomes available when will it stop being available? What's the best time? So the best time to see it, the highest point, it is outside of the time I can see it. Um, but it is uh, certainly giving me a lot of information, what constellation it's in and so forth. And then you can click through to that particular comment and get more details on it, including what uh, observers are doing and uh, how it's coming along here. As I say, click through, click it like you mean it, Dennis. There we go. So you can see here that this comet appears to be uh, still on the up, uh, but it's relatively faint. So it's between eighth and 10th magnitude. So that would be probably a challenging observation, but uh, potentially worthwhile. And based on what uh, the database is telling me, uh, this is our best opportunity would be for this comet. So where is 
Comet Panstar. So right now, Comet Panstars is actually pretty easy to find, um, relatively speaking. So it's hovering between uh, the Big Dipper and the Little Dipper. So you can see here the, the pointer stars that point to Polaris. Uh, so it's roughly 25% of the way between the pointer stars and Polaris, and a little bit below that line there is Comet Panstar. So that's very high up uh, after dark. Uh, it's ninth magnitude, so it probably will be a challenging observation. You probably might want to use a picture or a camera to, uh, <coughs> give me to get um, to pick, get an image of that. But nevertheless, um, this is a useful resource, and I'm going to try and see if I can take advantage of it, particularly for other observable comets that <coughs> may come into the frontal area in the future. In terms of meteor activity, nothing, nothing. I'm sorry, there's just nothing going on. I looked everywhere. There's, you know, they, there's, you know, maybe a meteor shower that didn't make it or something like that. But basically, there's nothing much to get excited about, um, and uh, that is all I have to say about meteors. How about that? Um, <clears throat> now, I mentioned uh, galaxies and so other things. So let's just cover some of the good targets that there are. Um, galaxy season is still on now. Uh, obviously, the moon is starting to get in the way. Uh, we're heading towards a full moon on June 5th, so the, there's no time like the present if you want to do some galaxy hunting. Um, Virgo is, is better. Leo is already starting to set, but some of these brighter galaxies may punch through. And as you can see, there's so many Messier galaxies all very close together um, that you're able to easily pick off a bunch of them. Um, but uh, it's important to get away from the city lights if you can. Find that uh, unused parking lot deep in the in the dark dark parts of the suburban Toronto and see if you can uh, spot some galaxies. It's very useful. Uh, we also have a couple of open clusters. This time of year is not great for open clusters. There's not that many of them in the spring sky, but there's M44 in Cancer, which is still uh, available in, uh, as the sun sets. Uh, it's a classic uh, you know, wide open cluster. Uh, we've got uh, M48 in Hydra which is a bit of a challenge object as well. And there's also M67 is near M44. And if you've got good skies, you can see both. And M67 is kind of an older cluster. It's more dispersed, whereas M44 is a little bit younger. And there's a nice contrast there within the same uh, area. The one thing that you can see <clears throat> at this time of year that's usually uh, uh, very rewarding are some of the better uh, globular clusters that we have available. So M13, M92, M3, M53, all accessible in the north or east. And uh, all of these are, are uh, some of the best globular clusters that we have available. Um, so uh, I certainly recommend it. I've been looking at M13 and M92 myself. I found M3, M3 um, from my backyard. I uh, wasn't able to get to M53 to, to, because I haven't had a chance to uh, bulldoze my neighbor's house, but I'll work on that. Uh, but they're all available and, and they do punch through even uh, city light pollution. They're, they're often very accessible. In terms of uh, ISS predictions, there's some um, good news and bad news. Uh, the good news is there's a few good passes coming up this week, uh, but there's very few passes predicted after this week in June. So essentially, uh, it's kind of like over the next few days, uh, you should get out if you want to have a, a spot the ISS a moment. Uh, also makes for a good video and um, uh, picture taking opportunities. In terms of uh, uh, the the pass on Friday, so I picked out this one here, courtesy heavens above. So this is Friday night around uh, 1030, uh, magnitude 3 point, minus 3.8, which is very bright. And as you can see, it's going to basically run right over the Big Dipper, possibly cream Polaris on its way through and eventually uh, petering out in Ophiuchus. So this one looks very, very, uh, you know, beautiful in terms of this. It's practically 90 degrees up, uh, which is a really, really nice, uh, really, really nice one. Having said that, there's also a not bad one tonight. So you have a chance to get out there right now or after the meeting, of course, 1030. It's in the north, northeast. It's going to get as high as 40 degrees or so and it's minus 2.6, which should be easy to pick out from everything else that's going on in the sky tonight. So, uh, but after June 2nd, um, there aren't very many visible passes, which I found a little interesting, um, <clears throat> probably something to do with orbital dynamics, 
uh, but uh, the Heavens Above website is the best resource for all of that stuff, and it uh, is constantly updated with uh, when the ISS boosts, and it's quite possible that when the Dragon uh, capsule eventually gets there, uh, there may be a boost involved with that because that's usually what the servicing missions do, and when that happens, the orbit uh, may change and uh, we may get a different set of passes, so it makes sense to always go back and check Heavens Above when you can. All right, now with that, I'm just going to um, show off a couple of my own pictures here. So I got a nice picture of uh, the Crescent Venus, uh, May 15th, and uh, I also got it buzzing the Pleiades back in April. So I've had a chance to get my camera out and uh, about, and I'll just hold off there for, see if there are any questions coming through uh, from uh, the team. All right, uh, Dennis, thank you so much for your presentation. Uh, great uh, as usual. Dennis, thank you again. And uh, I'll pass it over to Ennio to see if we have any online questions for Dennis. Well, I have one question myself. Um, <clears throat> pardon me. With Mars and the apparition of Mars, is there any detail on the southern polar cap? Um, are we entering southern summer or northern summer? Um, any idea of how much it may grow or shrink over the uh, portion? Uh, the picture, I think, uh, has a hundred, um, paints a, paint a, the picture says words. That's what I'm trying to say. <laughs> the picture says words. Uh, so yeah, this is, this is, this is the predicted uh, appearance of the polar, uh, southern polar cap over the next few months. So as you can see, here it is right about now. It's very prominent and that's what it's going to look like by October. So over the next few months, it's going to shrink significantly. Um, I don't have any better information than that right at my fingertips, but this is, I believe, uh, Northern summer coming into, into play. Thank you. Any more questions for Dennis? Dennis, I have a question myself. Okay. And maybe I missed it. You already touched on it, but uh, you used the word a pulse. Is ah. that synonymous to a, a conjunction? Uh, it's 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 synonymous, but it's more um, broad. So, a uh, pulses cover conjunctions uh, and uh, occultations together. Like any time two astronomical bodies get close together, um, so it's a little bit um, broader than uh, than a, than a conjunction per se. Um, and a cover, so I just threw that in there. I, I was doing a little research and I thought, wow, that's a cool word. I haven't used that one before. So I yeah. just threw it in there, but that's what it means, yeah. Very good, thank you. Yeah, so I haven't heard that word in a long time. <laughs> Any more questions, uh, Ennio? Uh, there are no more questions in the chat room at this moment. Okay, very good. Thanks again, Dennis. So All right, give us a moment. moment.